everybody and glad to see you again. We are going on a fabulous journey this evening to an amazing civilization, Pompeii. We're going to understand tonight how near the end really is. So come with me tonight on a journey to the future as we go back to the past. The city of Pompeii is an amazing city, a very large city by ancient standards. You can visit this civilization today. When you visit Pompeii, you will notice that they had large homes. They also had a marketplace called the Forum area. The Forum was the place where people gathered to do their business in the city of Pompeii. You could come here after going to the bankers to get your money, as it were. Come down here to the wool merchants, if you were the women of the house, to buy the wool to make the clothes for the family. Then you could come down here to the bakery shop to get your bread to take home that evening. After a hard day's work, of course, running through Pompeii, you needed to visit Kentucky Fried Chicken or Macca's. They even had that sort of thing in Pompeii, fast food shops, places where you could get food on the run. Then in the afternoon, you may want to relax after a day's shopping here at the theatre where you could watch your favourite actors' live drama. It was all there for the people of Pompeii. If you were the more sporty type of person, you could visit the sports arena and watch the gladiators fight to the death. That's the way they did it back in Roman times in places like Pompeii. The gladiators killing each other in front of the crowd, which made the people, that was the sort of sport they had. In the evening, you could come to the bathhouse and relax and have a hot, then a cold bath, sort of like a sauna bath. That was the way you could relax. Some people had other things to do in Pompeii. They visited these places, the brothels. In fact, Pompeii was a city given to pleasure, given to gross immorality. In fact, someone had scrawled, written on the walls of Pompeii, Sodom and Gomorrah. The archaeologists believe that Jewish people lived in this place because they wrote that, those two names, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. That was Pompeii, just like those places. Pleasure, wealth, luxury here in this city. They had their religion. They had their temples. You can see them there today. You needed some religion to keep your conscience happy, but not too much to spoil your fun. But religion never spoiled people's fun in the ancient world because they had temple prostitutes and all sorts of things in the temples of the ancient world. In places like Pompeii. But you know, my friends, always in the background was a sleeping volcano. A volcano that hadn't been active for about 700 years known as Mount Vesuvius. But one day in AD 62, 64, Mount Vesuvius started to rumble. It rumbled and caused an earthquake and it destroyed much of the city of Pompeii. But the people simply built up their city, not heeding the warning signs, and they carried on business as usual in their city. And then in AD 79, Mount Vesuvius started to rumble again, causing more earthquakes. But the people disregarded the signs and they continued on, life as usual, down through the streets and the activities of this ancient civilization, which was here just after the time of Jesus the Christ. Then, suddenly, on August 24, AD 79, Mount Vesuvius blew its top and it rained red-hot pumice stones on the city of Pompeii for three days and completely buried the city. And archaeologists have been digging up this city for many years. And as they've been excavating this city, they discovered the last tragic moments of a city that failed to heed the warning signs. When we look on our world today, 
we can see very clearly that it's not a case of will the world end, but when will it end? How near is the end? On all fronts, as we saw last evening, there are indicators to this world today that the world is in bad shape. How near is the end? We're going to discover that this evening as we continue on. I want you to come with me tonight to the city of Jerusalem. We're going back 2,000 years ago, about 40 years before the destruction of Pompeii. Here on the Mount of Olives, we hear some amazing predictions. Jesus the Christ, in his last week on earth, came here to Herod's temple as it was known. One of the great amazing buildings of the ancient world was Herod's temple, the one that Jesus came to when he was here. Herod the Great, the one who had tried to kill baby Jesus, had started building this temple. By the time Jesus comes along, Jesus the Christ is able to move into this temple while he was here. The disciples took Jesus on one occasion on a little tour of the temple. And you notice what happened. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. And well they might, as we saw, this was one of the amazing buildings of the ancient world, the temple. Now they were surprised when Jesus said these words. Do you see all these things, he said? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another, but every one will be thrown down, said Jesus. Not one stone of this temple will be left on another one. It's all going to be rubble one day. Now, that was quite an amazing thing, and the disciples were quite taken back by this. So after a short while, they moved up here to the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and they asked him a question. Notice the question they asked Jesus. Tell us, when shall these things be? When is the temple going to be destroyed like this? When is this going to happen? And Jesus gave them some amazing indicators of the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. He predicted that Jerusalem's uh, the future of this city. He predicted that, uh, things about the temple. And he also predicted things that would take place upon the Jewish nation. Very specific predictions Jesus made about those things. First of all, he said Jerusalem would be surrounded by a rampart, a type of a wall, and it would be destroyed. That was one of the first predictions Jesus made. Notice what he said. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build a rampart, a wall against you, and encircle you and hem you in on every side. That's what's going to happen to this city, Jesus said. Number two, he said the temple will be completely destroyed. We just read that, but let's put it up again. Not one stone left upon another as far as this temple is concerned. Now this was amazing because archaeologists have discovered some of the stones that form the platform of the temple. And some of these sorts of stones are massive stones. Notice the size, 20 metres long, 2 metres wide and 3 metres high. That's a very big piece of rock, right? Massive stones, I'm not saying those were the ones that built the temple, but these sort of stones existed around the temple area we now know from archaeology. Number three, Jesus said, the Jews will fall by the sword. They will be killed. Jesus predicted. Notice what he said. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword, said Jesus. A fourth prediction that he made concerning the people. He said the Jews would be scattered among the nations. They're going to be scattered among the nations of the world, Jesus predicted. Notice what he said. They will not only fall by the sword, and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations, said Jesus. 
One more prediction Jesus made. He said the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, would inhabit or live in the city of Jerusalem. Five very specific predictions. Notice that last one. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which in the Bible is a reference to the end times. So he said Jerusalem is going to be trodden down by non-Jewish people. They're going to live in this city right up until the end of time. Five very specific predictions made by Jesus the Christ. Now, were these predictions fulfilled? Did they happen? Let's notice what the archaeologists and the historians have discovered about Jesus' predictions. Notice, first of all, the Jews revolted against the Romans in 66 AD, and this became known as the Wars of the Jews against the Romans. Actually, it was over taxation. Taxes cause a lot of problems sometimes, don't they? <laughs> they wanted to tax the Jewish people, and the Jews revolted. And a war began between the Romans and the Jewish people. Eventually, by 70 AD, after four years of war, Titus, the son of the emperor Vespasian, he came down here to Jerusalem and he besieged this city in 70 AD. His father Vespasian had started this uh, against the Jewish people and he had attacked Jewish cities but he let the people escape but always in one direction, Jerusalem. So everybody's escaping from cities which he attacks but they're all going into Jerusalem. That city is full of people. Now the Romans had them all in one spot you see and they could deal with them. And so Titus besieged the city when his father Vespasian was made the emperor. He continued the war. 70 AD he attacked the city. What do we find? We know from history that Titus starved the Jewish people holed up in that big city. How did he do it? Notice what he did. Titus built a five-mile earthen rampart, a wall around the city of Jerusalem to keep people from getting in with food and to keep people from getting out to get food. Exactly as Jesus said, my friends, he predicted that. So it happens and we know that this is what took place. We know now that over one million Jews perished in Jerusalem. When the Romans caught them, they put them on crosses outside the city of Jerusalem. They became so thick, one of the records tell us, it was almost hard to move among the crosses because of the people on those crosses. What a tragedy. But Jesus had predicted many would fall by the sword. And of course, all down through this time, the Jews have suffered terribly as a people. We've had the Nazi Holocaust in the Second World War where six million were killed. Many were killed in other places around the world. These pe people have suffered terribly down through the centuries ever since. And Jesus predicted things exactly right. That's how they've happened. Now the Jews' last stand against the Roman people was right here in the temple. The Romans knew that this would be the place where the Jews would make their last ditch stand. They had actually built a fortress some years before this war because they expected such a thing. You will notice this fortress in the back here known as the Fortress of Antonia. This is a model, of course, today. But that was a fortress for the Romans to keep an eye on the Jewish people. Well, when the war finally came to order an end, the Jews fought inside the temple here. Titus told his soldiers, do not destroy this temple. This is one of the most spectacular buildings in the world. Don't destroy it. But in the fighting that took place there inside the temple, someone threw a firebrand into the temple and the whole thing went up in smoke and it destroyed the temple. And when the fires had died out from this great fire and the enemies, the Jewish people, had been killed by the Romans, the Roman soldiers, in an endeavor to get the gold and the silver, that had melted because there was lots of gold and silver in the temple built by Herod and it melted and it ran down between the cracks of the rocks and so that the Romans could get the gold and the silver between those rocks they tipped one stone off another 
to get the gold and the silver. And the temple was completely demolished. Not one stone left upon another. Those massive stones thrown down. You can visit the Jewish temple area where the temple once stood. And the only structures where the temple once stood are the Islamic buildings. The mosque here and one, another mosque and other structures belonging to the Muslims. These were built about 800 years after Christ. The temple is gone. Everything else is just flat. There are no stones one upon another now. Massive stones have been thrown down, just as Jesus said. If you ever visit the city of Rome in Italy, you must go to the Roman Forum. There in the city of Rome, to the old part of Rome where the Roman emperors lived and where the city did its business. You'll see the Arch of Titus. Here it is on the screen. This was the victory arch that Titus made before he became the emperor to commemorate his victory over the Jewish people in those wars that Jesus had talked about. And when you look up under the arch, you'll notice what you see, the Roman soldiers and the Romans carrying away the seven-branched candlestick from the temple in Jerusalem. Just as Jesus said the temple would be destroyed, here the Romans are carrying away the furniture from the temple of Jerusalem. Amazing! the predictions that Jesus made and how we see their fulfillment. And there is no Jewish temple today, just the Muslim mosque on the place where the temple once stood in the times of Jesus. Now the Emperor Hadrian, some years later after this, the Jews revolted again, the ones that were left around there, and they revolted and Hadrian decided the Jews are not going to live in Palestine anymore and he drove them out of Israel. And he drove them to the various nations of the world. And that's exactly what Jesus predicted. And tonight, you know, my friend, the Jewish people are scattered around the nations of the world. Oh, yes, there are a few million living in Palestine today, in Israel. But many, many more Jewish people are living in the great cities of the world, like London and Moscow and New York and great cities around the world. Just as Jesus said, Christ's predictions were exactly fulfilled, my friend. There is one other thing we need to notice. Jesus had said the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, would inhabit Jerusalem. You can visit the old city of Jerusalem today. There are four quarters. There is an Armenian quarter and they're Gentiles, non-Jewish people. There's a Jewish section, there's an Arab section, there's a Christian section. The Gentiles, by and large, Occupy old Jerusalem, just as Jesus said. It will be a city occupied by non-Jewish people. And that's the way it is today. Non-Jews live largely in Jerusalem. Amazing predictions, my friends. Palestinian Arabs, by the way, today control the Temple Mount. The Jews dare not try to move the Arabs off that mount because it's the third most holy place for Muslims around the world. When the president of uh, the prime minister of Israel went up there a few years ago. It caused a great uproar among the Jews and they've had fighting ever since because he went onto the Temple Mount. And so the Palestinians control it today. Now I want you to notice Christ's predictions were exactly fulfilled. Exactly. Which means we can trust the words of the Bible, as we saw last evening. You can know that the prophecies of God are going to happen. Since Christ predicted the things that happened in the past, Jesus hadn't finished yet. He then went on from the destruction of Jerusalem and all those things we just saw to our day. He moved on in time. I want you to notice those disciples said, Tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Oh yes, Jesus gave five signs to do with the temple and the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. But then he moved on to signs concerning his coming and the end of the world. You will notice the signs of his coming were connected with the end of the world as we know it today. We are going to see predictions right now that read like the newspaper 
that read like the Time magazine. You would think you were watching nightly news from what we're going to share with you now from the Bible. 2,000 years old these predictions are, but you would think they came off the nightly news. Let's notice what Jesus said. Jesus gave a number of indicators. One area of signs was in the natural world. Signs taking place in the world of nature all around us. Jesus talked about these indicators. Notice what he said. He talked about famines. Famines would be taking place in the end of time. Notice what Jesus predicted. There will be famines. My friend, did you know that famines are rampant in our world? 40,000 infants die every day in the third world, a report was given some years ago. 40,000 every day. Do you know what that is? That's two, every 2.16 seconds a child dies. One has died. Now another has died. Now another has died. Now another has died. That's a shocking statistic. But it shows that what Jesus predicted 2,000 years ago is exactly true. We are seeing an amazing indicator here. Did you know that the global, global grain harvest increased by 2.3% since 1990, it was reported some years ago? But did you know that population increased by 10% during the same period? In other words, there are more mouths than food to put in them. That's the problem the world is facing today, which is why this warning was given by Robert McNamara. Population growth is the gravest issue the world faces during the next decade, he said, and will have catastrophic consequences if we do not act. There will be problems. The problem, he said, if we don't act, will be solved by famine, by riot, by insurrection and war to get the food. You see, Robert McNamara, former president of the World Bank, this is a great problem for the world because of the famines that are taking place. The world is in great danger. Jesus spoke about earthquakes. Notice what he predicted. We would see toward the end of time. He said, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Wow, if ever that one was true today. You think about earthquakes. Did you know that earthquakes are increasing around the world today? Have a look at these statistics. Notice, until the 19th century, there were 2,119 recorded earthquakes. But did you know that, this is amazing, one year alone in the last decade or so, there were 21,500 recorded earthquakes. That's a big increase. That's not all. Think of this. Before 1900, there were 10 registered earthquakes over six on the Richter scale, the scale that they use to measure earthquake sizes. But look at this. Now there are 3,000 every year over six on the Richter scale. Jesus was right. Earthquakes in various places and we're seeing it today you think of what we saw last year in the poor city of Christchurch I was just there a few weeks ago they are still reeling from that disaster those poor Japanese young people in one building many of them killed along with others we think of the earthquake there in Japan and the tsunami that followed and these are just a couple we had big earthquakes in places like China a few years ago and so on. Jesus also predicted things like tsunamis and cyclones and flooding as we near the end of time. Notice what Jesus predicted. He said, the nations of the earth will be distressed and anxious. Why? Because of the roaring and the tossing of the waves. The seas, the waves, the waters will be in turmoil, Jesus predicted. Oh, how true that has been. We will never forget those images from the great Southern Asian tsunami just a few years ago 
when that huge wave just rolled over and so many people were killed in that tsunami. Not only that, think of the city of New Orleans just a short while after that. Terrible flooding in that city. I notice one of the worst floods, according to uh, people who record these things, took place just a couple of years ago, the Pakistani floods. Horrific floods that affected so many million people in that country. We had floods in Australia last year. I remember seeing those terrible images of a flash flood that just completely took away towns, houses. And you had floods three, two or three, early this year. You know what we're talking about. Jesus predicted these things. We're nearing the end of time, my friend. A Japanese tsunami that wiped out those cities. Think about the ecological crisis in the world today, the environment. My wife and I have just come back from China. We we're amazed to see people walking down the streets of those great cities of China with masks on their face because of things like pollution and so on. Pollution is ruining the world today as we pour poisons into the air and we pollute our atmosphere and we wonder why people have shortened lives. Think of the Fukushima nuclear disaster that followed that tsunami and that earthquake. I was just noticing the television news the other day in Australia where they were reporting that the levels of radioactivity among fish off the coast of Japan has risen in amazingly. Not good to eat them. Even in America they've reported higher radioactive levels in the fish. They were catching off the coast of North America, thousands of miles away. Pollution, you see, affecting the lives of people today. Think of the effects of deforestation, chopping down all the trees in places like Brazil and other countries. The effect that that's having on the environment is being measured by scientists today. I noticed Time magazine, front cover story, be worried, be very worried. And it gave a report on the melting polar ice caps they believe is taking place and the dangers that's going to be to the people in coastal areas and so on down through time that's why Lester Brown president of the World Watch Institute said some years ago we do not have generations we have only years in which to attempt to turn things around Jesus was right signs in the natural world they're all around us today my friend when you go to the book of Revelation which was also written by Jesus. He spoke to John on the island of Patmos. Notice what Jesus told John would happen in the end of time. Jesus said, as he talks to John, the nations were angry. Your wrath has come and the time of the dead to be judged. And then notice what he said would be happening in the end of time. And to destroy those who destroy the earth. There has never been a time in history where mankind can destroy this earth in a number of ways. We can do it by nuclear means. We can do it by biological warfare. We can do it in a number of ways, and we're getting pretty good at it, the way we're destroying this planet. How did the Bible know that as we near the end of time, people would have the ability to destroy the earth? Because this book is no ordinary book, and Jesus is no ordinary person. God knows the end from the beginning we saw last evening. So you see signs in the natural world. We see them all around us today. Then Jesus also predicted there would be signs in the political world, around the nations. Notice what Jesus predicted. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars as we near the end of time. Think about this. Jesus actually predicted that there would be global international conflicts just before the end of time. That's what he was predicting. Notice what his words now. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now you think of what's been taking place in our world over the last few years. The 20th century, last century, 180 million deaths from war alone in that century. That's a lot of people killed through war. 
I was reading in Newsweek some years ago, they reported 35 to 39 wars every year in a decade. What an amazing statistic. On this world tonight, there are wars taking place. And now today, politicians, scientists, they fear this one, the ultimate weapon that we have. Well might they fear, because the nuclear club is growing today. Many nations now have nuclear weapons, and that's why they're worried about places like Iran, and other places getting hold of nuclear weapons. The club is growing. The potential for something to happen is increasing by every time someone gets one of these things. And scientists and politicians fear terrorism in this respect. Now, Osama bin Laden has gone, but terrorism has not. And I was listening to a program in Australia recently where they were discussing the grave danger of some terrorist getting hold of what they call a dirty bomb, making a homemade nuclear device. These terrorists don't mind going up with everybody else. This is a very real fear today among political leaders, terrorists getting hold of a nuclear device. You see, Jesus was right again. Signs in the political world. Jesus also talked about signs in the social world. Notice what Jesus said. He talked about great moral decay as we near the end of this world. Notice what he said. Jesus said, or Paul's friend first, before we talk about what Jesus said, notice what Paul said, one of the friends of Jesus. Oh, we'll come to Jesus first, sorry. Because lawlessness will abound... The love of many will grow cold. In society, true, genuine love will be in short quantity, he's saying. The love of many will grow cold because sin abounds, lawlessness abounds. How true that is today. You know, in my country and other countries around the world, sometimes 80-year-old grandmothers have to lock themselves behind two or three deadlocks lest a 13-year-old young boy rape them that is the reality of our world in many big cities today let me tell you you visit some cities it's like you're in a fortress when you go home because of exactly what Jesus is predicting notice what Jesus friend Paul said you would think Paul was reading off the newspaper here one of Christ's friends look what he said as he's writing to his friend Timothy he says but mark this no, take a note of this, he's saying. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Oh, how true that is. Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boast, by the way, lovers of money. That's why the world is in the current global financial crisis. Because of greediness among some financiers in the world. A few years ago. The love of money. Boastful of proud abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I can take you to many places in this world today where the churches are empty on Sunday morning. But go in the evening or the day before and the stadiums of sport are packed to the rafters. Because you see people in the world in general are lovers of pleasure today rather than lovers of God. This is true. We can see it in our own eyes, our own, before our own eyes. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Paul, you got it right the friend of Jesus. This is the world we're living in today, my friends. A lawless and a loveless age. My friend, I want to ask the question tonight, is this happening in our world today? Are we really in a lawless, loveless age? Let me show you in one simple illustration tonight. 
Here are the top problems in schools back in the 1940s. Some of you were at school in those days, not too many probably. Well, probably none of us were at school. We might have been babies. All right, the top problems in schools back in the 1940s. Here they were, talking in class. What a serious problem. Chewing gum in the schoolrooms, making a noise at school, running in the halls, cutting in line, not waiting your turn, no uniform being worn to school, you left it at home, or littering, throwing paper around. Aren't they serious problems? We smile, don't we? What are the top problems in the 2000s? Here they are. The top problems today in schools, many of them around the world, here they are, drug abuse and drug use by school kids, alcohol abuse by teenagers, pregnancy among school kids. Not only that, suicide, tragically, suicide is increasing among many school kids today. Rape at school, robbery and assault. You would think you were on a different planet in just 50 years. The world has moved dramatically. Unbelievable. Jesus was dead right. A lack of love as we near the end of time. You think about this one. American children aged 7 to 10 years of age. Do you know what these kids are afraid of? This is what they're afraid of. 63% are worrying about dying young at 7 to 10. They shouldn't even be thinking of such a thing. But that's not all. 71% of these 7 to 10 year olds feared getting stabbed or shot at home or school. Unbelievable. 7 to 10 year old kids in America. And one more. In the United States of America, one quarter of all juvenile gun related victims, it was reported, are killed by other children. One quarter by other children. I tell you, my friend, tonight, are we listening? Are we listening to the warning signs that Jesus gave so long ago? Signs in the social world. Jesus also talked about signs in the financial world, the Bible talks about, as we near the end of time. Notice what the Bible says. We go to the book of Revelation. And we're going to be going here more and more as we move on through this series. Right there in the book of Revelation, in the heartland of Revelation, in the center of this book, we're going to see an amazing crisis that takes place and how you and I can be survivors and victors in that crisis. But notice one of the things that John sees. He says as, he nears the end of, as we near the end of time, the merchants of the earth, that's the financiers, the merchants of the earth, weep and mourn. Why? For no man buys their merchandise anymore. For in an hour these great riches have are made desolate. In other words, the Bible is predicting there is coming a day when there will be a gigantic global economic crash. That's what it's predicting right here. Now, I want to talk to you about globalization for just a moment. Globalization is where the world is becoming a global economic village or has become one. I have an interesting book in my library written by uh, Thomas Friedman. A very interesting read. He's explaining how come we have globalization, why we're a global village. He says there are a number of factors that have been driving us to be a global village. And here they are. He says we're a global economic village today because of the telecommunications revolution. We connected with everybody in the world. You believe me? I've seen you people here on your mobile phones all the time. You're probably ringing Australia or Canada or something, right? I was in Papua New Guinea out in the bush. And there they were when we took a break on their mobile phones. The telecommunications revolution has taken place everywhere in the world today thanks to internet, mobile phones, credit cards. What's a credit card? It's a small loan. That's what it is. You can get the stuff to connect with the world. You know, you can be 80-year-old grandpa here in Fiji, if you want to, buy a second-hand computer. They're quite cheap today compared to going and buying them new. And you can set up business right here in Suva or any other city in Fiji 
and sell icy poles to Eskimos up there in the North Pole if you want to. Isn't that right? You can because of this globalization. Now, there are serious implications that we are a global village. And here is one of them. When one falls, one country falls, it can pull others with it. We can pull each other down. And I would remind you that the world tonight is on the brink of financial disaster. You see, we had a few years ago, 2008, 2009, a great financial crisis known as the US subprime mortgage crisis and the world got into what we call the global financial crisis. That's exactly what we still call it today since this time. Today I notice on the internet they still talk about GFC because we're not out of it. And I would remind you that in Europe one by one nations are falling apart economically. You think in 2010, I was in Europe at the time, Greece and Ireland had to be bailed out. I think Greece has now been bailed out twice by the European Communion. And then, of course, in 2011, Portugal had to be bailed out. Last year, the American government almost ran out of money to pay their debt that they owed to somebody. The world went very close last year to a financial meltdown. And now this year, 2012, Spain has just had to be bailed out. And now they're worrying about Italy. How long will that survive? You see, my friends, the Bible was quite true. Economic crisis in the world as we near the end of time. People are thinking, people are saying, how much money can we borrow before one day it all collapses. Trillions of dollars in debt countries are around the world. We're in, we're in trouble today and Jesus predicted it so long ago. Signs in the financial world. Jesus also talked about signs in the religious world as he talked 2,000 years ago. I want you to notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, this gospel, this good news of the kingdom this good news will be proclaimed in all the world and then the end will come. This is the last sign. Jesus gave a number of religious signs, but the last one and the last of all the signs was that this gospel would be proclaimed around all the world and then the end would come. What is the gospel, my friend? What's this gospel? The gospel is that God loves everybody and he wants everyone he wants no one to be lost. He wants everyone to be saved. That's the gospel. God's kindness is extended to the whole human race. I noticed this beautiful promise here that tells us that God loves all of us. The Lord is not slack concerning or when it comes to his promises. God's promises will be fulfilled. Or time may go by, but God will come through with his promises. Notice what he says, but it is in, he is incredibly patient with us. He's not wanting anyone to be destroyed. That's why he's waiting. It goes on to say, but that all should turn away from sin. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. My friend, why has not Jesus come? He's given us these indicators because of you. He loves you, he loves me, he loves people and he holds back as long as he can. But one day he's going to say, enough is enough. Jesus will come. The signs will be over. The gospel will have spread to all the world. Now I noticed in Time magazine just a few years ago that the gospel is going rapidly to the whole world. They gave a report in Time magazine, a secular magazine, on this very indicator they showed that and they said if people believe the Bible if people really believe the Bible they would realize that the end is very near because and then it gave a report of how the gospel was going right across the world in many countries today did you know just the Bible alone think about these statistics in 1900 1900, the Bible was in 537 languages of this world. What about today? 
In 2011, it's in 2,700 languages around the world. That's really a huge amount today. That's not all. In 1900, there were 5.4 million Bibles distributed per year. What about today? There are 100 million Bibles distributed every year in this planet. You see, the gospel is spreading very rapidly around the world today. Very rapidly indeed. You see, God is on the move today with the gospel news. Come with me to the former communist USSR. Communism had held that country in fear for many years, but when communism collapsed in the USSR, people were able to gain access to the Bible and to the gospel. Many, many people came to Christ, thousands by the million people who had never known freedom of mind, never known peace of mind, never known the joy of Jesus in their life. Thousands of people came to Christ in that former communist country. The gospel was going to the world. Come with me to other countries. I've just returned from communist China. I spent an afternoon with some young people there, my wife and I. There they were praying in a place that in one, a few years ago, you would never be able to do those sorts of things. But communism has opening up the doors and allowing people to gain access to the Bible and to meet together. It's wonderful to see young people in communist China being able to hear the good news of the gospel. Come with me to places like South and Inter-America and over here to the Philippines and then come over to Africa. Do you know people by the millions are accepting the gospel that God loves them and he has a heart for them and he wants them to have peace of mind and have a life that counts with meaning and hope for the future. People by the thousands coming to Christ in places like Africa and the Philippines. Come with me to India. India is the fastest growing place for the gospel message today. People by the millions in India are opening their lives to God and finding a new life, a new peace of mind, a new way to live, a hope for the future. You see, the gospel is going to the world today, my friend, just as Jesus predicted, signs in the religious world. My friend, tonight, we have seen global warnings that were given by Jesus, especially, that show us that we're nearing the end of time. Remember what they are. Signs in the natural world we saw. Signs in the political world, Jesus said. Signs in the social world. We've seen them all. They've taken place just as Jesus predicted. In the financial world and in the religious world, we've seen just a few. We could spend all night sharing with many other signs. But they're happening. My question tonight to you, my friend, is this. Jesus said, when you see these things, know that it is near, even at the door. His coming, he said. When you see these things take place, know that my coming is near, even at the door. Are we listening? Are we heeding the warning signs? Are we taking notice or are we asleep today in our world? When the greatest event of all the ages is soon to take place and Jesus the Christ will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to set up his kingdom that we talked about last evening. And so it was on August 24, AD 79, Pompeii rose to a new day of life. People left their homes and they came down the streets of Pompeii for a new day's activity. Some of them came here to the business district to do business. Some of them, no doubt, came here to the fortune tellers, the, future, the people who were supposed to tell the future. And they were supposed to be able to read the future in the dust patterns, at the, in the basins and the bowls that they had. They believed you could read the future in things like that. But they couldn't even see what was going to happen in a couple of hours, and then it happened. Mount Vesuvius blew its top, and it rained that red-hot pumice on the city. Some people tried to leave, it, leave the city through these gates here into Pompeii. They tried to leave them, but they left it too late. 
And they found people at the gates of Pompeii. They perished because they failed to heed the warning signs. Some people came up here to the cemetery to have a party in honor of the dead. But they left it too late. And they perished in Pompeii. They failed to heed the warning signs. Somebody came back here to get bread from the baker. They found the bread 2,000 years later, but the people left it too late. And they perished in Pompeii because they didn't heed the warning signs. Panzas, he came running, or sorry, the, the priest in the temple, they came running back for some of their, their sacred objects of worship, some of their idols, some of their statues, some of their gods and so on. They came here to get them, but they left it too late. And they perished in Pompeii. Panzas, he came running back to his house to get some objects of art, would you believe? But he left it too late. And he too perished in Pompeii. My friend tonight, the tragedy of failing to heed the warning signs. And God has given to us in his book, amazing warning signs we know they're true because all those other things about Jew Jerusalem and the Jews they all happen and we're seeing these other things happen before our very eyes today you see the Bible not only talks about the past but it helps you and I understand what is taking place now so that we can make a course correction so that we can be ready for the greatest event that is soon to take place are we heeding the warning signs you see, when Christ returns, we saw last evening, that's when he sets up God's forever empire, God's forever kingdom, a place where there's no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more war, a forever home of peace. God wants you tonight, whether you're listening on the radio, you're watching on the internet, you're one of the downlink sites right here in this Vodafone arena, he wants you to be ready. How do you be ready for the end of the world and the return of Jesus Christ how can we be in God's forever empire come with me back 2,000 years ago you saw the film some of you many of you the passion of the Christ Mel Gibson's Hollywood block blockbuster on the death of Jesus the Christ you saw the film probably I would remind you when Jesus the Christ died on that cross he was crucified between two thieves the Bible says. Two thieves were crucified with him. Now the Bible tells us that at first both of these men made fun of Jesus. If you're the son of God, they said, get off the cross and save yourself and us with it. They mocked him just as the Roman soldiers did, just as the Jewish leaders did, just as the people did. Everybody mocked Christ that day, including these two men. But one of them, after a while, he realized that his life was about to end and he wasn't ready to face eternity. He realized that he wasn't ready to meet God. Wasn't ready for when God would set up his forever kingdom. But he noticed what had been happening to the man on the middle cross during that day. He had heard Christ as he was nailed to a cross Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Who's them? The people that were mocking him, the people who were laughing at him, the people who were nailing him. In fact, the original language indicates that Jesus repeated those words again and again. Father, forgive them. Forgive, forgive, forgive. The thief could not get that out of his head. He read also over the head of Jesus that it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Hadn't Pilate asked Jesus the question, are you a king? And Pilate had said, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would fight for me, but my kingdom is from somewhere else my kingdom is a heavenly kingdom my kingdom is the rock of Daniel 2 we saw last evening now that thief began to realize 
as he thought about Jesus and what he'd seen that day, he began to realize that the man on the middle cross was someone very special. He realized that this king was not just the king of the Jews, but he was the king of the universe. He was the savior of the world. And this thief, he turned to his other friend who was mocking Jesus and he said to him, listen here, pal, don't you fear God? We're in the same problem as this man on the middle cross, but we're getting what we deserve. We deserve to die. But this other man, he said, he's done nothing wrong. You see, this man realized that he'd been playing life in the fast lane, as we say, and now the game was up and he was about to die. But the man on the middle cross, he realized, had the answers to life and eternity. And then he turned to Jesus and as he turned to Jesus on the middle cross, he asked this question, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realized that this Jesus, this king of the Jews, had a coming kingdom. And he was saying, Jesus, can I have a place in your forever kingdom? That's a soon to be take over from the kingdoms of this world. Can I have a place? You could have heard a pin drop at the cross. Everyone was silent. They wondered, how would Jesus answer this man? Surely he would say to him, forget it. You've been mocking me. You can't have a place in my kingdom. Surely. They thought Jesus wouldn't have mercy on him. But they didn't have long to wait. Because quick as a flash, Jesus seemed to lean across from his cross to talk to that man and he said, my friend, he said, I want to tell you something. Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, my kingdom. What was Jesus saying? He was saying to this man, on this horrible day, today, when it looks like my cause is lost, when I'm finished, I'm telling you on this day, there is coming a day when you are going to be with me in my forever kingdom. Amazing, my friend. The good news of God's love. God can tell the future. God knows the end from the beginning as we've seen tonight. He knows what time it is in earth's history here tonight. But he loves every person, including people like this man on the cross. My friend, tonight, I have good news for you. The good news is that God loves you. He has a plan for your life. There's a reason for existence. There's a hope for the future. God is still on his throne. He's still in control. We don't need to be afraid of the future. And those people who have put their hand in the hand of God have said like that thief, God, I need your help. They have a future that's brighter than tomorrow. My friend tonight, God wants you to be ready for his soon return because he's coming soon, as we've seen tonight. And I'm going to give you the invitation, whether you're in this building tonight or one of the downlink sites, maybe you're listening on the radio, to say, God, I need this hope that this thief got when he said, Jesus, help me. My friend tonight in this stadium, and if you're at a downlink site, I'm going to invite you to come right now down to the front because I want to talk with you after we're finished for a few moments to pray with you, to help you as you start a new journey tonight. If you've never accepted God's mercy and God's grace, you've never said like that thief, God help me, I'm going to invite you. Whether you're at a downlink site, you go to the front of the room there to the screen. Whether you're right here in this auditorium, I want you to come down now to the front as our choir sings. You say, God, I will be part of that kingdom. You come while the choir sings. If you're up there in the balcony there tonight, you need to leave very quickly to go down there. The ushers will help you find your way. You'll come out here, down here, and I want to meet you. If you're in the seats here, you come forward to say like that thief, God, I want to be in your forever kingdom. I want to accept your offer of grace. You come tonight as our choir sings. You come now. Don't wait. Move quickly from where you're sitting never accepted God's love or maybe you turned away but tonight 
You're making your decision to say, I'm going to be in God's kingdom. You come now while our choir sings. of your kingdom which is soon to be set up you make that decision now if you're still wondering whether to come tonight you slip out of your seat and you join us down the front so we can pray together in just a moment as soon as the choir is finished singing we're going to close our meeting and we're going to pray with our friends who have come forward tonight is there someone else God is speaking to you tonight and you need to leave your seat and come right now. Don't put off a decision like this, my friend. We cannot decide when to come. We must come when God is calling us to come, when he's speaking to us. That's the time. Jesus said, the wind blows today, but it's somewhere else blowing tomorrow. You come while God is calling. Make your decision to be in God's kingdom by saying, like that thief, Jesus, have a place for me. When the choir has finished this verse, we will close with prayer. If you're coming, you keep coming right now to say, Lord, I'm going to be part of your forever kingdom. God is so pleased. He's been waiting, holding things back so that you can have eternity. Wherever you are this evening, right now, you make this decision. Whether you're at a downlink site, you come forward right now. Maybe on the radio. You make this decision and say, Lord, like that thief, I'm going to be part of your forever kingdom. Maybe on the internet tonight watching, this is your moment. God is speaking to you. You make this decision to say, Lord, I'm going to be in your kingdom by coming just as I am. pray together oh God and Father in heaven thank you for the grace of our God that as the Bible said you've been waiting for years you've been holding things back because some have not yet made a decision but we thank you tonight that many people have said yes to God many people have said I'm going to be part of that kingdom of God like that thief I'm going to say Jesus accept my life thank you for those who've come forward thank you for those who have been listening tonight on the radio at our downlink sites those watching on internet thank you so much be with us as we go to our homes tonight keep us in your care thank you for the prophecies of the bible that we know what time it is but we also know who's in control in jesus name amen